chapter number 4 beginning at verse number 7 it says beloved let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God he that loves not knows not God for God is love in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the substitute for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Pastor preached Love lifted me. Bishop preached what's love got to do with me. So today I'm going to preach and teach from the topic a perfecting love. A perfecting love. Father God, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for this time to share your word. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I decrease that you may increase. None of me, all of you. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon me. God, I've studied, but you preach. God, I've prepared, you teach. Give your people what they need today. Arrange, rearrange my notes that you might have your way today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 A perfecting love. A perfecting love. February is considered the month of love. During this time, chocolate and chocolate candy sales increase. Hallmark cards about love increase. Teddy bear and flower sales increase. Jewelry and other specialty items increase. The number of gift cards purchased and received increase. Why? 
Because people are focused on giving these things as an expression of their love. Love is an interesting word. It's an interesting idea. If you've ever really encountered love, then you know it's a verb. It's an action word. And that it requires some expression to follow those words, I love you. In this passage, John says, God is love. The world thinks that love is what makes you feel good. And it's willing to sacrifice moral standards and compromise beliefs and violate the rights of others in order to obtain this false love. People will manipulate and do all kinds of things in an effort to convince someone to love them. Young men and women, in an effort to be loved, will compromise their beliefs, sacrifice their purity, give their bodies to someone else, all because they said, you know I love you, right? <laughs> that, that's not a godly love. So see, if you love me, help me to honor God and save myself from marriage. I know that's not popular these days, but, but if you love me, don't try to get me to do something that we both know is wrong. And if you love me, support and encourage me. Don't trick and try to manipulate me. If you love me, recognize that my body and your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That my life and your life is not our own because we've been brought with the price. So you see, we cannot apply the world's view of love to a holy and righteous and just and perfect God. See, God does not have love. God is love. Notice it doesn't say love is God. See, in other words, love does not define God, but rather God defines love. So, so what is the perfecting love? I'm, I'm glad you asked. The, the Apostle John says, no man has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is made perfect in us. His love is made perfect in us. See, God, God's love is already perfect. But this is about the Lord perfecting us about maturing us, about developing us so that we become a reflection of him. If we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. God's love is perfected where? In us. There's a song that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. If you have decided to follow Jesus, that means becoming his disciple. Moving from being curious to being convinced to being committed to follow him. It means moving from accepting and believing in Jesus to becoming more and more like Jesus by following his example. As we've discussed over the last few weeks in, in Bible study, we've been talking about discipleship. and Every disciple of Jesus Christ is a Christian. But not every Christian is necessarily his disciple. See, when you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, that makes you a believer. That makes you a citizen of the kingdom of God. But you don't become a disciple until you decide to follow Jesus. It's not an easy road, but the rewards are worth it. Remember, it was not the multitudes who turned the world upside down. It was the disciples. It was not the multitudes who performed miracles. It was the disciples. 
It was not the multitudes who received the great commission. It was the disciples. And so in John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love one to another. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Love has to be demonstrated. That's right. Love has to bear fruit. You cannot tell me you love me, you love me, you love me, and there's no evidence of your love towards me. No one has seen God, but they see you. They see me. They see all of those who say they know God. All of those who say they love God. But when we walk in love, then God can be seen in you and through you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 1 John 4.20 says, If a man say, I love God, and he hates his brother, he is a liar. Yes. For he who loves not his brother who he can't see. How can he love a God whom he cannot see? You demonstrate your love of God by how you treat one another. How you want to tell me how great your God is, but you treat me like dirt? You want me to love your God, but I can't see you demonstrating his love to nobody else. or not. Whether you know it or not, people are watching you. They are watching you. And they're making evaluations about God based on how they see you living. Not everybody's going to read a Bible. Some Bible that people are only going to read is you. So you got to make sure that you are reflecting the word of God. Because why would I come and follow you and your God when I can't see no evidence that you've been with God? But when I see you loving your neighbor, when I see you treating people right, when I see you doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, when I can see the light of God shining in your light, I'm drawn to it. But if all you casting is darkness, and I'm in darkness, neither one of us can see the light. If the blind lead the blind, they both what? Fall into the ditch. We've got to be a light. And so I, for a few minutes that I have remaining, I just want to highlight three things about a perfecting love. A perfecting love, first of all, is personal. A perfecting love is proven. And a perfecting love is preserving. Let's do the first one, personal. God's love for us is personal. And it causes us to love God. And it causes God to love us. People are hurting. People are suffering. People are feeling all types of ways these days. They're feeling loneliness and depression and anxiety and fear and worry and uncertainty with all this craziness happening in the world all around us. But one of the most powerful messages that we can take to the world today is that God loves you. No matter what it looks like, God loves you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the number of hairs that used to be on your head if you ain't got none anymore. He knows your thoughts are far off. Before he formed you in the belly, he knew you.
of the birds. I mean, just the other day, I looked out the window, and I thought the birds were supposed to be down south right now. But, you know, it was after the snow, after the snow plow came, in, and they, they threw some salt on the ground, and next thing I know, all of these birds is coming. I say, are they eating the salt? Like, what are they doing? There's no worms in the middle of the street. What are they doing? But they were down, they were splashing in the little puddles. They, they, they were eating the little grains of salt. They were licking the snow. Even in the midst of a snowstorm, God was still providing yeah. for the little birds. Oh, yeah. When the springtime comes, nobody has to tell the grass to grow. It just grows. God just continues to grow and, and produce. Everything in creation is responding to the love of God. If he takes care of the little birds, how much more are you? How much more are you who are made in the image and likeness of God? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And he knows all his sheep by name. God's love is personal. It's not just to know enough to know who Jesus is. You must develop a personal relationship with him. But he's not going to force his way into your life. You must open the door and let him in. He stands at the door of your heart knocking. All you got to do is say, here I am, Lord. Lord, I'm available to you. My storage is empty, and I am available to you. God's love is personal. Second, a perfecting love is proven. Remember, love requires some action. It's an action word. In 1 John 4 and 9, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he loved us so much that he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Yeah. God's love for us was manifested or proven to us through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Love is a verb, it's an action word that is demonstrated by your behavior. The love of God is no exception. Romans 5, 8, it says, but God commended his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While I was yet sinning, he died for us. While you was in the crack house, he died for you. While you was in whatever you was in, he died for you. Whatever. It don't matter. From the guttermost to the uttermost, wherever you was at, he died for you. He gave his life for you. He substituted his life for your life. He paid the price that you should have paid, that I should have paid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Have you ever heard the story of the pit? A traveler was going along and he fell into a deep pit and he could not get out. Several people came along and saw him struggling, trying to get out of the pit. The sensitive person said, I feel for you down there. The reflective person said, it's logical that someone would fall into the pit. The interior designer said, I can give you ideas on how to decorate your pit. The judgmental person said, only bad people fall into the pit. The curious person said, tell me how you fell into that pit. The legalist said, I believe you deserve your pit. The IRS agent says, 
Are you paying taxes on that pit? The Zen Buddhist says, just relax. Don't even think about the pit. <laughs> the optimist says, cheer up. Things could be worse. The pessimist says, be prepared. Things are going to get worse. But Jesus, seeing the man in the pit, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the miserable pit. The point is this. It doesn't do any good to talk about love and compassion if you do not demonstrate it with your actions. God demonstrated his love for us. So our perfected love is personal. It's proven. And finally, it preserves. It's a preserving love. God did not send his son to die on the cross just to prove that he loved us, but to give us eternal life. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? His only begotten son. Why did he give him? So that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because of God's love, and only by his love, can our lives be preserved for all eternity. In order to save everyone, he had to give his only one. He gave his only one and gives us an opportunity to be with him for all eternity. That's an everlasting, preserving love. When I think back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but then there was the tree of life. And so that man would not partake of the tree of life, he kicked them out of the garden. Now, if you first look at that, it's like, wow, why you kicked them out of the garden? But it was purposeful. He said, because if they touch the tree of life in that sinful condition, there would be no eternal redemption because they ate of it in a fallen state. But because he kicked them out, he left a way for you to get back in. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. When we accept him, it restores the connection. It restores the relationship. And it preserves us for the rest of eternity. Come on. That's, love. That's, love. That's love. That's love. That's love. That's love. That's love. As believers in Christ, Jesus gave us some last instructions known as the Great Commission. When he told them to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. He said, go and make disciples. But it takes one to make one. Jesus called his disciples and said, come, follow me. When they decided to follow Jesus, he taught them. He trained them. He equipped them. He empowered them. And then he sent them. He said, as the Father has sent me into the world, I'm sending you into the world. Yeah. Yesterday, I attended this uh, virtual event called The Greatest Love Affair. It was the 22nd annual one. I think I've been to just about all of them. And, and it's an awesome event that's held to honor um, missionaries. But it's to serve the greatest missionary of all time. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus the Christ. I don't care what mission field a person goes on. Nobody traveled as far as he did on the mission. He came from heaven to earth to show us the way. From the earth to the cross. My sins and your sins are dead to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. Lord, we lift your name on you. No greater love than this that a man would lay down his life for his friend. And so there were missionaries who served all around the world in places like India and Asia and Europe and Nigeria and Malawi, Nova Scotia, Haiti, Benin, and other countries. This is the place, this, was, this meeting is where I met Tim Wright, the, the executive director of Pomoza. Is at this meeting two years ago when I took Sister Pam with me, when we talked to, to Tim again, she said, you know what? We're going to Malawi. And we got all the information. And I looked at Sister Pam and she said, I'm going. I said, well, I'm going too. <laughs> and, and, and thanks be to God, we went. With the help of Community Baptist Church, we were able to go on the mission field to Malawi. And so all of these people who were there, they heard the, the Macedonian call for help. And they said, here I am, Lord. Send me. Now, not everyone can or will go abroad to a foreign country, but we all have a mission field. It could be your classroom. It could be your football team. It could be your basketball team. It could be your gymnastics team, your chess club, your girls club, your boys club, your family, your friends, your inner circle. Wherever God sends you, you're on a mission for him. We have to be the light of the world. We have to be the salt of the earth. We have to become living epistles. We have to become the example of the scripture. We have to be living examples, living billboards that says what? The Lord loves you. And so do I. Yeah. The Lord loves you. And so do I. And so as I bring this to a close, if you discovered the cure for cancer, would you keep it to yourself? Or would you try to tell everyone that you meet, I have something that can change the world. If you have accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then you literally have a cure to everything that you face. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Because he changed you. Now it's time to be like the Apostle Paul and invite others to like, share, and follow you as you follow Christ. So when you come across somebody and they may be going through and you ask them, are you sick? I know Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Are you hungry? I know the bread of life that came down from heaven. Are you lonely? I know someone who sticks closer than a brother. Are you lost? I know the Savior of the world. Are you bound? I know the deliverer. Are you broke? I know Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Are you in me? Well, guess what? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Whatever you need, he is because
until the day of Jesus Christ. His love is perfecting me. His love is maturing me. His love is growing me. Because God loves us, we ought to love one another. He is the pot, and we are the clay. Let him shape you. Let him mold you. Let him continue to use you because he's perfecting you in love. His love is a perfecting love. God bless you. And every day he's perfecting you. He's molding you. He's, he's shaping you. But you gotta continue in his word. You gotta continue to walk with him. You gotta continue to talk with him. Each and every day. Not just on Sunday. Every day. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Not our weekly bread. Not our monthly bread. Not our every now and then bread. But give us this day our daily bread. We need a daily dose of Jesus. I don't know about you, but every day I need just a little more Jesus. To help me along the way. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. If you are in this place today and you do not know him, today is the day of salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Tomorrow is not promised to any one of us. But if you don't know him today, fix it. Jesus died for each and every one of us. I don't care what you've done, how many times you did it, Come on, Lord. Thank you. or who you did it with. Thank the Lord. He loves you. He died for you. And so if you don't know him today as your personal Lord and Savior, we offer Christ today. We offer you a chance to meet the one who died for you. And so if you don't know him, we offer Christ today. The second call is for membership. You say, I know him, but I just don't have a place to worship. I don't have a place to learn and grow and develop. Are we perfect? Not at all. But we serve a perfect God. And so if you need a place to fellowship, we offer Community Baptist Church, the church with a heart for God. The last call is for the backslider. The word says he's married to the backslider. He didn't walk away from you. You walked away from him, but he's still there. That's right. Calling you, your name. You, he still has a plan. He still has a purpose for you. And if you're still alive, he still got something for you to do. And so if you don't know him, you need a church home, or you just need to be reconnected, we offer those to you. He loves you. He loves you. He's perfecting you. He's maturing you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. We honor you. Thank you. All right. 
I want to give the benediction. But after I give the benediction, don't go anywhere just yet. Amen. Okay. So don't rush out the door. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord. Father God, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts and minds have felt. God, we thank you that you love us. Thank you that you died for us. Thank you that you rose for us. Thank you, God, for keeping us. Thank you for using us for your glory. Continue to have your way in our lives. God, not our will, but thy will be done. We thank you that your angels and camp round about us, protecting us on every side. God, we thank you that we're blessed going out. We're blessed coming in. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now, henceforth, and forever. And the people of God say, Amen. Everybody. Amen. Amen.